Greetings in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, here at First Lutheran Church in Chickasha. My name is David Thompson. I am pastor here, and I am glad that you chose to be with us on our online worship of Pentecost Day. Let us sing our first hymn, it's him 913, O Holy Spirit, enter in. The text will be printed on your screen. Let us begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. 
We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. But for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I announce this forgiveness in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray the collect for the day. O oh God, on this day you once taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending them the light of your Holy Spirit. Grant us in our day by the same Spirit to have a right understanding in all things and evermore to rejoice in his holy consolation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in communion with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading for this Pentecost Sunday is taken from the book of Numbers, chapter 11, verses 24 to 30. So Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. He brought together 70 of their elders and had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him, and he took of the spirit that was on him and put the spirit on the 70 elders. When the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. However, two men, whose names were Ildad and Medad, had remained in the camp. They were listed among the elders, but did not go out to the tent. Yet the Spirit also rested on them, and they prophesied in the camp. A young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun who had been Moses' aide since youth, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses replied, Are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Then Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us speak Psalm 25, verses 4 to 5, responsively. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior. And my hope is in you all day long. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The second reading for this Sunday is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1 and continuing to verse 21. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and was filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd 
came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Now, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us speak the Alleluia and verse printed there. Alleluia. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel is found in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. It is the text for our meditation today. Glory to you, O Lord. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty... Let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. This is the gospel of the Lord, Praise to you, O Christ. Good morning, boys and girls. I'm so glad that you're with me here at church, even though you're at home playing it safe. I have something here in my hand that I think you know what it is. That's right. It's a glass of water. Why do people drink water, huh? That's right, they get thirsty. Very good answer. When does that happen, though? Okay, when you, when you play or when you eat like dry cookies, like Cookie Monster, or uh, it's a very hot day. And when you can't get to water right of way, you really get thirsty in your mouth. And if you don't drink water for days and days, you could die. In our gospel story for today, 
A week before going to the cross, Jesus stood up and said, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. You see, just like our bodies need water to live, our spirits need Jesus. The thirst he is talking about is a spiritual thirst because we don't know God by ourselves. Spiritual thirst is, uh, is, comes to you and, and makes itself known in things like when you feel guilty for doing something wrong or you're scared that you're going to be punished. Without the love and the forgiveness of Jesus, our spiritual thirst just gets worse. So this is what Jesus was inviting people to do. Come to him for life. Now, what he was saying is if anyone is spiritually thirsty because they've done something wrong, like not obeying your mother or your father or hurting maybe a playmate or doing something that's wrong, he says, come and I'll forgive you. If anyone is spiritually thirsty because uh, they feel bad, or they're scared, or something's bothering them. He's saying, come to me, and I'll help you. That's the whole reason that Jesus died on the cross, to be your savior from all of those things. He wants you to come to him when you are spiritually thirsty. And you know what else? He says that he'll put his spirit in your heart. When a neighbor kid hurts you and says, I'm sorry, what can you say then? That's right. You can tell him that you forgive him. If another friend is scared or something's bothering them, then that Holy Spirit within you uh, can help you to be a friend to them and help them to tell an adult so that you get help and they get help with the thirst for peace and comfort. So remember this, Jesus is your savior. He loves you and wants you to come to him when you are feeling like your spirit is thirsty. Let's pray about that. Bow your heads and repeat with me. Thank you, Jesus, for helping us and using us to help others who are spiritually thirsty too. Amen. Thank you. You can go back uh, a little further out and watch the rest of this service with your parents. And we're going to continue with singing this hymn of the day, 496, verses 1, 2, and 5. Holy Spirit, light divine. It is projected up onto your screen. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A few weeks ago, I saw a 3D visual of 
all the connections and links between the Old Testament prophecies and New Testament fulfillments. The graphic showed uh, it was like a Bible on edge and it had colored lines or arcs rising from the Old Testament passages like ballista missile launches and then curving back down as if um, re-entry was into the New Testament at the appointed book, chapter, and verse. Now, the number of connected verses was staggering. And the bright arching lines, there were so many of them, blended into this neon glow. And I couldn't help but think of those old telephone switchboard operators there were rows and rows of them in each room sitting in front of these banks of panels that had little quarter inch holes in them. And as a call came in, they would insert a cable, like a speaker cable, manually to connect the caller to the number of the person that they were trying to reach. So at any one time, they would have all of these cables arching from one hole to another over and under and intertwined amongst themselves. And I thought, wow, if all of those cables lit up were like neon cables, wow, what a sight that would be. A bright representation of all of the thousands of people and locations connected by the telephone. That is what I think of when I look at the liturgical readings for a Sunday, the Old Testament, the Epistle, the Gospel, and the Psalm, all selected because they are connected. Or when I look at a concordance showing all of the related text on a particular word. All of them so interdependent and interrelated. Now today is the day of Pentecost, a pivotal point in our church calendar. To the Israelites, it was one of three required attendants at these harvest celebrations and began on the 50th Sunday after the Passover. Now, the Passover commemorated the Exodus, which occurred after the last plague, the death of of the firstborn. It is not a coincidence, you see, that on the day Israelites were looking for a Passover lamb, Jesus rode into Jerusalem. That when they were slaughtering and eating their Passover lambs, Jesus hung on the cross as our Passover lamb. That on the day the Jews brought the very first sheaf of the grain harvest on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit brought 3,000 souls into the church by Peter's word and the sacrament of baptism. And that eight months prior, Jesus stands up at the Feast of Tabernacles, inviting all to come believe and receive him so that living water might well up within them. It is all interconnected and it shines, it glows as the handiwork of God. So Jesus and this huge crowd of Jews were at the Feast of Tabernacles and it's mentioned only one time in the New Testament. Leviticus 23, though, explains its beginnings and that it began after the harvest on the 15th day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. And so it began with a with a Sabbath and every native Israelite was to construct and live in outside uh, in these booths made of limbs and 
and reeds to remind them of their ancestors' homeless wanderings because of their unbelief. Those temporary huts remind us as well that this world is not our home. We are just passing through. So everybody had to live in the booths, rich or poor, young and old. The ground, you see, is level at the foot of the cross, and everyone needs Jesus. So each day, in thankfulness for the harvest, a priest would take a golden pitcher and go down to fill it at the pool of Siloam, which means scent. The pitcher was carried back through the water gate while the people recited Isaiah 12, verse 3. Listen, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. It was then carried up to the altar and poured out with great rejoicing as the offering to God. And it was at that moment, I believe, in our gospel, verse 37, that we hear on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Here, Jesus is revealing that the true source of living water is not a pool. It is none other than himself, who was sent from heaven above to die on the cross for our sins. Scripture interprets scripture, right? All of the prophetic promises that had wet the Israelites' tongues for thousands of years find their connection right here in Jesus. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to later receive. So there is no mistake. John connects the Lord's prophetic promise with Pentecost 50 days after the resurrection and Passover. The divine tapestry torn by sin is pulled together at this point. A stitch is made and tied. Oh, the riches and the wisdom of God. Dear friends, this announcement and invitation rang so loudly then and still does now because woven into our fallen nature and world by sin is this fast, our thirst for what we have thrown out. And that is a relationship with our creator God as his blessed children, receivers of all that is good. And Jesus stands up and announces that he is no mirage, our desert Desert wandering is over. He will satisfy that very thirst. Have you ever been thirsty? Really thirsty? Think about being so thirsty that your tongue sticks to the roof of your mouth and all you can think of is water. Joey Mora found out what it's like to be that thirsty. In 1996, he was a young Marine standing on the platform of an aircraft carrier cruising in the Iranian Sea. He accidentally fell overboard and wasn't missed for another 36 hours. A search and rescue mission started but was abandoned after 24 hours. Joey's parents were notified that he was missing and presumed dead. But he wasn't. Four Pakistani fishermen found Joey 72 hours after he had fallen off the flight deck. He had taken off his pants, 
tied knots in both legs and trapped air in some of them. And this kept him afloat. Joey was delirious when they pulled him into the fishing boat. His tongue was dry and cracked. His throat was parched. In a story to Stone Phillips of NBC Dateline, Joey said that it was God who kept him struggling to survive. And the most excruciating thing of all was being surrounded by unsatisfying seawater and his body and brain just thirsting for what else? Water. And that is the kind of spiritual thirst you and I have that God wants to quench in our souls. When Jesus stood up and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He is seeing the gaunt souls of people drinking the seawater of human wisdom, of politics, of religion, of human accomplishment, physical health and wealth, but which in the end cannot satisfy. We look at the fumbling and bumbling through this pandemic for a savior doctor or a savior vaccine. But like a mirage, they disappoint. Even with a vaccine, my friends, COVID, like all viruses, will simply wait. But Jesus doesn't wait, right? He stands and calls all who are spiritually thirsty with guilt, loneliness, deception, and fear of death. He breaks the fast. Jesus satisfies all who are thirsty for the things of God and invites us to come to him and drink deeply. After the second year of seminary, Sharon and I went on a road trip to visit congregations who had uh, had been supporting us. And, and we went through several states. Uh, we, we went to several cities. We went through Pennsylvania. We went into Chicago. Um, and uh, uh, we took some side trips as well. And one of them was the American Niagara Falls. And I was in awe at the power and volume of the rushing, seemingly endless water flowing by. But of course, it's not endless. One day, it will cease to flow. The living water Jesus speaks of, however, is forever. He who believes in me as the scripture has said, streams of living. That means continuously bubbling, going. There's no end to it. It doesn't, doesn't stop. It doesn't drain out. It doesn't lower. Streams of living water will flow from within him. You've got to remember, John has acted as the operator connecting this believes, this faith, and the eventual eternal flowing waters with the sending of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. The connection is not chronologically, you believe, and then I will send the Holy Spirit. No, but it's that God the Spirit creates the faith in order for us to believe in Jesus. Remember, faith is a gift. So that our relationship is then woven by God together with God, our Father, again. We are forever his children, the objects of his love, and the recipients of his goodness and providence. This world will pass away, but this promise will never pass away. It flows from the Holy Spirit within us forever. Now Luke writes of the fulfillment. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. The, the 12 apostles, 
or the 12 apostles and all the disciples, 120 in all. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Please note, where this came from, from heaven above, and that the apostles were then filled with the Holy Spirit and enabled These tongues or languages were to fulfill an unstoppable mission to bring the word about Jesus to all peoples. This speech flowed out in an understandable tongue to quench the spiritual thirsty gathered for the harvest festival of Pentecost. This is the beginning of the glorious harvest of souls that will flow until the return of Christ. What does this mean? That's a perfectly Lutheran question. And Peter quotes the prophet Joel, speaking of the last days, referring to the time between the ascension, which we just celebrated, and the return of Christ. Don't get wrapped up in all of the visions and dreams it talks about there. One view is that those were certainly fulfilled and recorded by Peter, Paul, and John. We see the superiority, though, of the new covenant in baptism where God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Circumcision was only for men. Women had to fall under a believer who was circumcised, either their father father or their husband. While baptism fills both men and women with the spirit to prophesy, that is, to speak for another. Men and women, born again, born of God from above through water and the spirit will testify freely of Jesus in all of their various callings and opportunities, whether that's a mother or a father, a teacher or a welder. And the faith proclaimed by Peter and the disciples launches out there in human language to re-enter into the hearts of thirsty people across time and continents and begin springs of living water in the hearts of those who hear forever. Despite the opposition, the prowling and waiting of our adversary, the word of the Lord endures forever. The spirit never sleeps and the invitation is always extended. The word, the spirit, and the church all woven together and shining as the handiwork of God. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through true faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed, third article, and then the small catechism explanation. It'll be uh, projected up on your screen. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What does this mean? I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him, but the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. 
On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. Let us pray. We pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. To you, O Lord, we lift up our souls. In you we trust, O God. You have shown us your ways and taught us your paths. Guide us in your truth and teach us, for our hope is in you all day long. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, every person, believer or not, is thirsty for the grace of God, whether they know it or not, because we wander through a dry and weary land of accusations, guilt, division, and loneliness. We are separated from and powerless without you, the source of living water. Thank you for fulfilling your promise to send the Holy Spirit that the river of life would be flowing from within us. Life begun in you, a providence that never ends. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. How many are your works, O Lord? In wisdom, you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures, but we all suffer the weakness of the flesh and certainly know those close to us who are in need of your master's touch. Especially we lift up Lynn Walden, recovering from cancer surgery. Renee Martin, also recovering from cancer surgery. We pray for Jean, Bruce Pitts's stepdad, perhaps at the end of days. Comfort him, O Lord, and bring to him the knowledge of Jesus. We pray for Kelly Smith, soon to be uh, in labor with twins, due on the 8th or the ninth, the eighth. And so we pray, Lord, uh, for that good and uh, uh, successful delivery. We pray for Marcy Clark, who has COPD and high risk in these days of the pandemic. We ask that you protect her and keep her lungs strong and the virus far away. Lord, we pray for Janelle Goulet, Bill Thompson at Glenhaven Rehab, Evelyn Lyle at Glenhaven Assisted. We pray for Karen Collins with osteoarthritis and ask that you would, uh, you would reduce the pain that she deals with every time she moves her joint and bones and hands. Lord, we pray for Dorothea Thorson, Annalisa Hook, and Jerome Ursuline in their particular isolations. We mourn together with the family and friends of past president of the Lawton Zone, LWML, Marilyn Selk, as she entered glory last week to the words, well done, good and faithful servant. We pray for our Oklahoma District President, Reverend Barry Hinkey, undergoing infusion therapy for myasthenia gravis, a neurological um, uh, degeneration. He's had this before, and uh, it is uh, causing him some problems, Lord. And we pray the infusion therapy uh, works wonders and that it allows him improvement. Lord, these all look to you to give them their healing at the proper time. Renew their faces in the presence of their adversities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, even in our fallen condition, humanity has reached for the stars. We have learned so much about your creation and seek to know more, but keep us from becoming impressed with ourselves so that we do not worship you uh, as we should, but instead always keep you first. By the Holy Spirit, place your praise on our lips in every conversation and in every celebration of human accomplishment. We keep in our prayers this most recent endeavor between SpaceX and NASA to commercialize and make common man's travel in space. Shield and protect our astronauts from harm and return them to the earth with faith-filled awe and respect for the gift of this planet. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. As we prepare to reopen our congregation for in-person worship, lead us in our attempts to be responsible and careful that no one bring or contract any illnesses, but more importantly, for those healthy, may they all come to give thanks for being together once again, for hearing your word and receiving the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now into your hands we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We pray that prayer which our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. I would like to share some announcements with you. Tom and Laura Wicks will be uh, celebrating their anniversary on the 3rd of this month, June and um, we have no birthdays coming up this next week. During this time of quarantine, do ask you to continue to mail in your offering so that we can be responsible uh, for our financial obligations as a church. Send them to First Lutheran Church, P.O. Box 387, Chickasha, Oklahoma, 73023. Please note the Sunday that you are observing and uh, note your envelope number if you have one. Also register your attendance as you have been by a separate text with the names of viewers and the service date. We will begin to meet next Sunday, June 7th. The council has formulated all types of practices that are going to help us gather safely. And we hope to have a video this next week uh, to provide you with a visual of some of the changes that you will encounter. Things are going to take longer, so please get here early or on time and put this into your planning. High-risk persons, however, should remain at home and continue to enjoy these online services. There will be a voter meeting I incorrectly told you a date of uh, June 19th, but it'll be July the 19th. And uh, the council has discussed how we might do this with social distancing uh, practiced. Also, confirmation class will begin Friday, June the 5th at the normal time. And uh, again, masks and social distancing will be observed. I make an apology because doing these videos are um, usually done you know, a week ahead of time. And uh, so I did not always look ahead. And I, last week, failed to bring focus and prayers on the Memorial Day observation. While there were no complaints, I certainly um, did not intend any offense. Now, June the 21st, we will be recognizing our high school graduates, Tierra Rowe and Tricia Christensen. We will not be able to gather for a reception, but please come, be prepared to drop your cards, your gifts and, con and congratulations into a basket at the door, and then move on out so that you might uh, be outside social distancing, uh, weather permitting, as they exit via the front door and go down the sidewalk. One other thing, Camp Luther Homa will be having an abbreviated camp. Uh, Caleb will be one of the counselors, and if you are interested uh, in that, please look to their website for more information. At this time, 
Let us sing our closing hymn, 830 verses 1, 4, and 6. Spread the reign of God the Lord. And the words will be projected there on your screen.